Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Hannah Smith, and I'm a health educator at Hamilton County Public Health. I do case management work for families throughout the county whose children have lead poisoning. Today we'll be talking about lead poisoning to identify preventive measures and behavioral issues in children. So let's get started. First, we'll start out with a brief history of lead. Lead paint was used until 1978 when it was banned in the United States. Lead paint was thought to be a great thing. People loved it. Um, it didn't chip back then. And there were all sorts of advertising and marketing promoting lead. That was before we knew the health hazards associated with it, of course. Many homes built before 1978 are at risk of having lead-based paint, um, as well as houses built around the 1980. Um, although it was banned in 1978, there wasn't an official cutoff, and some other homes might be at risk. Low-income families are most vulnerable to lead poisoning due to housing conditions and poor nutrition. So where does lead come from? Where is it found? Sources of lead are often coming from the home environment. Most of our cases, uh, we see that lead poisoning comes from lead-based paint. So lead paint chips that are often found um, on windowsills or in doorways that either fall on the ground um, and children eat them that way, or they're touching things and then putting their hands in their mouth. As we know, children are obsessed with putting their hands in their mouth, um, and lead paint also tastes sweet to them for whatever reason. So that's how we most um, commonly see lead poisoning. Um, there can also be lead-based lead uh, dust. So the same thing if you have lead paint on a windowsill or a doorway and those structures are constantly being opened and closed, then the lead dust is being spread throughout the house, the child is inhaling it, um, or it's getting on their hands or toys or pacifiers, sippy cups, what have you, and then they're putting those to their mouth and becoming poisoned that way. Um, sources of lead can also be found in water and soil, although that's pretty rare, uh, particularly lead poisoning coming from water. As we know, in Flint, Michigan, there's been a huge issue there with children being poisoned from lead in the water. Um, and it actually comes from lead pipes that leach lead into the water if there's not proper corrosive control. And so I'm not a chemist, so I'm not an expert on how it works in water, but Hamilton County Public Health has partnered with Greater Cincinnati Water Works and they have told us that there are 16,500 city-owned lead branches throughout Hamilton County. So those are lead branches that lead up from the street to the property line. In 2015, 38% of these have been removed since 1971. So there is some progress being made. The tricky part is that the privately owned lead branches, so after at the property line um, to the home, those are the responsibility of the homeowner, and replacing those can be very expensive. However, uh, a temporary solution to prevent um, lead from getting into your water is to have a water filter on your faucet. You just want to make sure that when you buy the water filter that it's NSF certified, the National Sanitarian Foundation, and some examples of lead-certified water filters are um, some brands are Aquafana, Brita, Zero Water, um, and there's many more out there. You just want to make sure to carefully read those labels to make sure that it says NSF certified. Sources of lead can also um, come from recent immigrants may be poisoned. Um, if they're coming from different countries where the air quality wasn't as good or it's coming from their home environment, and then they come here and find out they're poisoned, um, that can be another factor. Certain cultural practices um, may also lead to lead poisoning. Um, certain cultures, such as um, 
Indian people often have the sindoor, and that can have lead in it, as well as certain prayer powders, um, certain foods made um, in other countries where lead is abundant um, in spices or um, other foods that are made or imported, that can be a cause as well. Home renovation um, can also cause lead poisoning. Um, a lot of times if um, a family member or a contractor who's not lead certified goes in and is scraping things and tearing up this and that, that can cause the lead dust to spread and it can make the problem worse. So if you are going to have any home remodeling done, it's recommended to um, ask the contractor if they're certified in lead abatement. Um, and if you do any home remodeling yourself, uh, just caution that it, you have to be very, um, it can be very tricky. So you don't want to use a, a belt sander, a propane torch, a high temperature heat gun, a dry scraper, or dry sandpaper to remove any lead-based paint. You also want to remove any furniture from those areas, um, put plastic up um, in those areas. You're going to want to change your clothes after you leave um, and wash them separately from your children's clothes. Do not let your child have access to that area, and just be sure to shower and wash your hands um, because it can exacerbate the problem, and we do not want that. It can also come from occupational exposures. So if you're a mechanic or you work at a shooting range um, and you're exposed to certain car parts or bullets that have lead in them, as well as hobbies containing, pertaining to fishing, hunting, other things, they um, may cause lead poisoning as well. So here are some examples of some lead-based paint. Usually you can, we describe it as when it looks really scaly, um, when it's a flaking kind of alligator skin, that's when, that's when you know it's lead-based um, paint. Um, and just to remind everyone, um, lead paint is only hazardous when it's chipping. So if it's intact and everything's fine, then that's not an issue. But when you see this kind of chipping paint along this door frame, again, that scaly look, that's kind of a, um, a trigger that this is lead paint. Here are some more examples. Here's a windowsill that has chipping paint, um, as well as a garage. Uh, you can see here it's chipping, and then these children's toys are down here. The paint is getting on them, um, as well as dust. And so it doesn't take very much lead to poison a child. So that's why it's pretty serious. So you would want to remove all toys from this area and do not let children near these lead hot spots, if you will. Here's another example of a door frame as well. So as we know, Lead poisoning is very detrimental, but it's, and it's a widespread problem. But how widespread is it exactly? Um, the CDC tells us that there are currently 535,000 U.S. children ages 1 to 5 that have blood lead levels high enough to damage their health. That's pretty terrifying. 24 million homes in the U.S. contain deteriorated lead-based paint and elevated levels of lead-contaminated house dust. And it can cost $5,600 in medical and special education costs for each seriously lead-poisoned child. And that's why we're here to learn about it and address this issue. So here's a map of Hamilton County. You can see here, um, it's kind of hard to read the legend, but those dark red areas are where lead is the most prominent. So obviously, um, in the city of Cincinnati, has very old infrastructure. We see a lot of red here. Um, but where we work and see things a lot is the Laughlin Redding region, um, Arlington Heights. You have Newtown down here, um, Norwood, et cetera. And so just because those areas have red doesn't mean it's limited to those, but that's where we see 
a reoccurring problem with lead poisoning. So what exactly are the consequences of lead poisoning? I'm talking about how bad is it, what does it actually do? And it's most harmful for children under the age of six because their brains are developing the most during those ages, and they're also crawling, uh, putting their hands in their mouth, dropping their toys, um, and putting everything in their mouth again. Um, it affects their nervous system, which can cause, um, it can cause learning disabilities, lowered attention span, uh, which can lead to ADHD, uh, slow growth, hearing loss, poor muscle coordination, decreased muscle and bone growth, hyperactivity, speech problems. It can affect problem-solving skills and memory. And in severe cases with high blood lead levels, it can cause coma or death. Some symptoms are frequent headaches and stomach aches, tiredness and fatigue, low iron, um, irritability, hyperactivity, aggression, things like that. Those can all be symptoms and kind of some warning signs to be like, hey, maybe we need to get this child um, checked out for their, uh, to see what their lead levels are. And unfortunately, many children may not show symptoms until later in life. So that's why we uh, always tell our families to monitor behavior, pay very close attention to your child's growth, um, are they developing as expected, et cetera, and to really um, let us know so that if they are experiencing those, um, any difficulties, we can refer them to appropriate services that they may need. It can also cause premature death and low birth, rate, birth rates um, if pregnant women are poisoned, and it's also harmful to adults. So um, it can cause fertility problems, high blood pressure, digestive problems, nerve disorders, memory and concentration problems, as well as muscle and joint pain. And so to give you a little background about what we do here at Hamilton County, um, we get involved when a child's um, elevated blood lead level is at least a, a level five, and that's five micrograms per deciliter. No amount of lead is safe in the body, but this is the CDC's new threshold um, for us to get involved. And so if a level is anywhere from a five to nine, um, I will get an alert um, from the Ohio Department of Health that has received results either from a primary care physician or the Children's Lead Environmental Clinic. They will get um, a venous blood sample um, analyze it in their labs, and then it's directed down to us here in Hamilton County. I will then contact the family and schedule an appointment to come to their house and go over a questionnaire to see um, if, they, if they've noticed their child eating paint chips, if they've noticed any uh, flaking paint, if they have certain occupations or hobbies that were discussed earlier, if they're recent immigrants, et cetera, to try to see where it's coming from. And then I give them information on how to get it out of the child's body and um, information and other resources that can help them with this. If the level is 10 micrograms per deciliter or higher, I will still go out um, to the family's home and go over the questionnaire and do the same sort of process with referring them to resources um, and giving information on how to prevent further exposure um, as well as getting out of the child's body. But I'm accompanied by a risk assessor. So what they'll do while I'm going over the questionnaire, they'll stay at the house for several hours and they'll go through basically every nook and cranny with tools that will tell them the amount of lead that's in the paint or in um, They'll also take dust samples and soil samples that will also be analyzed. So then if lead is found in the home, because remember it can come from other sources, although it's common, commonly found in homes, that might not always be the case. And orders will have to be written on the house to um, get the lead out to, for lead abatement. So if the family is renting, the landlord will be responsible for that. If they're a homeowner, uh, the family is responsible for replacing 
the windows or doors, whatever may be causing the issue. Uh, all children on Medicaid, um, it's recommended that they be tested at one years old. Uh, personally, I think it's great to have every child tested um, by the age of one because it's a common problem, and it's not a reflection of bad parenting or anything like that. It's very common, especially in this area with a lot of old infrastructure, but um, especially children on Medicaid are to be tested. And then children living in homes built before 1960 are especially uh, should be tested because their home most likely has lead-based paint in it. And we also provide at Hamilton County Public Health free testing of lead um, paint chips. And so if you're interested in that, you can call our Waste Management Department, and their number is 513-946-7879, and you can arrange to drop off the paint chips. We'll test them for free and let you know um, if it is present or not. So we're talking about all this bad stuff about lead. How can we prevent these issues? Um, there are certain cleaning techniques, uh, which I'll get into a little bit. If you have a clean home, um, wiping up the dust and getting rid of the paint chips, that's really gonna help prevent uh, lead poisoning and further exposure. Having a healthy diet in iron, calcium, and vitamin C helps excrete the lead from the body. Lead is stored in the bones and is cumulative, cumulative, excuse me, cumulative over time. So it's building up over time. And for whatever reason, the iron, calcium, and vitamin C bind together and um, get the lead out of the body. You also want to make sure that you're washing your child's hands frequently, um, as well as their toys, pacifiers, sippy cups anything like that that could have lead dust on it that's going to get into the child's mouth. When washing toys, uh, particularly, you want to do that in a plastic bin and then dispose of the water down the toilet. So you don't want to put it down your sink because that's going to just spread it around more. Water filters, as mentioned before, on the faucet are a good way to prevent it in your water. Um, and then just having routine blood testing and Waterworks will also test your water for free if you're interested in that. And obviously a way to prevent lead if you suspect it's coming from a certain area, like a window that has chipping paint or you got the results back and you already know your child is poisoned um, and it's before me or the risk assessor gets out there, you just want to remove the child from any hazards. Um, if it's really bad, it may mean relocating with a family member temporarily or um, just blocking off areas that may have lead so that the child can't get there. Moving any toys away from that area, if their bed is near a window or door that may have it, you just want to not have the child around it. So diving a little bit deeper into the cleaning techniques, um, you want to mop. You don't want to sweep. Mopping, um, that sort of wet cleaning, absorbs the lead dust and it doesn't spread it around. If you use a regular vacuum or you sweep, it's going to spread it around and make it worse. After you mop, you want to dispose of the water down the toilet. We do have a HEPA vac loan program at Hamilton County Public Health. And what that is, it's $100, and if you bring in a check, we keep the check, and once you return the vacuum after a week, we give you your money back. We don't cash it. It's just kind of our insurance policy to make sure we're getting our supplies back. But the HEPAVAC has a special filter that traps the dust and doesn't spread it around in the air. And you can also buy some of these HEPAVACs, um, but you just want to be very careful um, and possibly contacting the distributor to make sure it is indeed a HEPA vacuum. A lot of times marketing will say that it is and it's actually not, so um, the safest bet is to participate in our loan program. And if you're interested in the HEPA vac, um, our number is 513-946-7879. And again, that's with the Waste Management Department. 
Um, you will also want to clean any surfaces, particularly those um, that have the lead dust or paint, so your windows, et cetera. And you want to do that with a wet cloth or sponge. The wet cleaning techniques, again, absorb the lead. Excuse me, absorb the lead and do not spread it around. Moving on to the healthy diet, iron um, is a great way to get rid of lead in the body. So iron can be found in whole grains, so your cereals, your oatmeals that are whole grain. You want to make sure that the first ingredient listed says whole something to ensure that it's um, indeed a whole grain. Um, also, lentils and beans are full of iron. Dark leafy greens, such as your spinach, kale, and collards. Um, quinoa is another whole grain. Um, poultry, broccoli, egg yolks, uh, fish, and some red meat. I don't recommend having children eat a lot of red meat, but iron can be found there as well. Iron, um, oftentimes a doctor will prescribe iron supplements if a child has high lead levels. Um, that can even just be a vitamin that has iron in it. I think there's Flintstone gummies, um, but you just want to make sure it says with iron. Um, that's key here. In addition to iron, you want to have a diet full of vitamin C. So obviously this is your citrus, your oranges, lemons, limes, bell peppers, any type of berry, blueberries, strawberries, etc., raw cabbage, broccoli, things of that nature. And finally, calcium. Calcium is going to be found in your dairy products, your milk, yogurt and cheese, soy products, so tofu, edamame, soy milk as well. It's going to be found in broccoli, potatoes, chicken, uh, fish, things like that. Um, and obviously there's going to be a lot of overlap. I think broccoli is included in all three. Uh, but that's um, the key here is that you want a healthy diet. For whatever reason, kids with poor nutrition or if they're anemic, um, they're more vulnerable to lead paint. This iron, calcium, and vitamin C helps excrete the lead from the body. And you want to eat all of these things in one meal if possible. So, for example, if you have a tuna sandwich with, for your child with some slices of oranges and a glass of milk, you're already hitting it all there. And that's another thing I go over with the families for education is teaching them certain um, foods and recipes that have these things um, because they may, may not know. And that wraps up my presentation for the most part. Um, here are resources to find out more information. Um, this is really where our knowledge comes from, um, as well as our guidelines. So the Center for Disease Control and Prevention is a great source. Um, their website is listed here. It's also a great source for any public health issue you may be interested in. There's also the Ohio Department of Health who we work with. Um, they have a lead program and more information on their website. And then um, Hamilton County P Public Health, of course. We have a lead program, that's what I just talked to you about. Um, and if you go to our waste management section on our website, there is a lead poisoning section that goes into more detail about everything I just said. And then there's also Greater Cincinnati Water Works. Um, if you're interested in learning more about lead in your water or if you have, or if you have a lead service branch, um, they can directly tell you um, and they have mapping and can just go into further um, explanation since they're chemists. So I just want to thank you again for tuning in, to learning about lead poisoning. Um, it is a very scary issue, but it is preventable. That's the one thing I want you to take away. Um, and there are resources available to help you um, get rid of lead and to ensure that your child is healthy. Thanks again, and I hope you found it informative.